In this recording session, we're going to be going over the fundamentals of metal forming. Um, some of the topics we're going to be covering are the different types of bend operations, as well as the different types of tools, their usages and advantages, as well as some of their drawbacks. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the mathematics involved in bending, the K factors, bend deductions and allowances, uh, precision flat patterns, their importance, um, the key to success, um, as well as go over a little bit of bending software and some of the value that that can hold. This is a little bit about me. My name is Michael Bates. I'm an application engineer here at SigmaTech. Um, I've got about eight years of experience in the manufacturing industry. I've worked with a lot of talented individuals and have been able to learn a lot. Um, first thing we're going to cover is what is a press brake? Um, a press brake is a large industrial machine that uses hydraulic force that generates large amounts of uh, tonnage to uh, bend materials such as aluminum, steel. Uh, they utilize a changeable tool system, a punch and die style system, just like a turret press style. Um, changes the, in machines can be anywhere from a 36 inch machine up to 100 feet or more. Forcage can range anywhere from a couple tons up to into the thousands. Uh, some machines can be linked together to create what's called a tandem machine, which you see pictured down here, where you can actually string the machines together to create one larger machine. These are some of the components and what makes up the machine. You've got a rugged structure that's going to be the machine frame itself. It's going to be rather bulky, uh, made out of probably two or three inch thick material at least. Um, you have some hydraulic cylinders that are up here in the top left and right corners that are covered by these guards. That's where you're going to get your pressures from that drive downward onto the, the upper beam here or the ram as it's called. You have the fingers which help you hold your parts into position so that you know how to hold the part into the machine. You also have the upper and lower tool holders as well as the lower beam that's stationary itself. Most of your movement comes from the top of the uh, machine here. Next we're going to look at a little bit of the machine axes and kind of how they break down. Here's a super simple example, kind of a, a two axis machine. So you've got X being your back and front, backward and forward motion, and then R being your up and down for the fingers. Most of your machines nowadays are going to be a four or a six axis machine. You can see in the four axis machine in the bottom left hand corner there that the uh, fingers move independently left and right, but they do move together forward and backward. Um, and then up and down as well. So they can move independently left or right, but their forward and backward motion is kept the same. Uh, in the six axis machine we see in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that the machine is now able to move the machine, the fingers independently, left or right, forward or back, and then you still have the overall forward and back motion of the machine as well. Air bending is the most common method used today, which is what we're going to discuss first. This uses three points of contact to determine the bend. Um, it's the most modern method. It's easier on the machine, it uses less tonnage, and the rule of thumb is that you would use a six times the material thickness to perform the bend. So if I'm using a, a quarter inch mild steel and I'm wanting to pour it off a quarter inch radius, I would use a one and a half inch bottom die to drive that. Um, and like I said, that's the most widely method used nowadays. Next we have the bottom bending, which forces the material all the way into the die. Um, this is kind of an outdated form of bending nowadays. Uh, it's still practiced some and even required depending on the parts, but what it does is it pushes the material all the way down into the bottom of the die. It doesn't actually reshape the material, but it does use the entire bottom die. And it requires a lot more pressure from the machine, anywhere from three to five times the pressure to perform the same bend as air bending. So you can see why it's not used as often because it is going to be much rougher on the machine and the tooling. Uh, lastly, there's coining, which is also uh, quite often confused with bottom bending, but what coining actually does is where you push the material all the way down to the point of the bottom of the die, and then you continue to push to you actually imprint the radius into the material, so you're actually stamping with the punch into the material, so it's going to thin that material around the curve. This is way harder on the machine, uses anywhere from five to ten times the amount of force to perform the same bend that you're already bending with the air bending. It's really rough on the tooling and it's not really used very often anymore and I don't recommend it. Next, just some of the type of bend operations that can be performed on a press brake. 
First we have bump bending. What that is is it's for large radius bendings or for bending radiuses outside of your tooling. Um, you use multiple hits to break up the bend. So I'll play the video here so that you can see. And you can see that the operator goes through and performs several shallow bends to create the radius. Once he does the, about the third or fourth bend here, you can see the radius starting to take shape. And then at the end of the video here, he shows you that the machines do have safety features in place so that you don't get hurt operating the machine or get stuck between the, the press and die. Uh, I don't recommend testing it this way. This guy doesn't like his fingers near as much as I do, so he tries it. I wouldn't recommend it. And that's bump bending. Next, we've got offset bending or joggle bending as it's known as. What joggle bending does is it utilizes a different style of tool that you can see here that has two points of contact with the machine. So basically it performs two bends at once, just making a small joggle in the material so that it just comes out a quarter or half inch different to the left or right. I'll go ahead and play the video here so you can see it. So you can see the double bend there and that the machine's now done. It's performed both bends at once. The last one is going to be hemming. What you'll see when the machine starts here, this is a special hemming die that they've got in the machine that has a roller in it. You can see the first bend will actually rotate here. You can see the machine roll. We can watch that rotate in the center here. And it's going to bend past the point of 90 degrees so that way once this is done you'll see the machine lift up. The operator will then reposition the part and he'll stamp the the part close. So what a hem is actually bending the material over on itself to complete a, to create a smooth edge. Um, there's different types of hemming that you can do that allow it if you don't close it fully so that the parts can be interlocked or riveted to something else or something like that but a standard hem is a full close like these are about to perform here. There's an open hem point and then he pushes past that to close the material fully. And that's basically the basics of hemming. Next, we're going to talk about crowning. What crowning is is actually a lack or a displacement of bend at the center of the bend. Um, with the pressure points being from the outside of the material, or I mean the outside of the machine, and then coming to the center of the machine where the part is actually being bent so that all the tonnage is available for the machine's use, there's a lack of bend because you get a pinch point at the edge, so the edges get bent harder than the center. So even though you may have a quarter inch bend at the ends of the part, you could have a half inch through the center of the part. What uh, crowning does is raises the center or the bend point slightly, increasing the pressure so that it holds that bend true across the edge. Um, in the past, this has been done with pieces of metal, wood, or even paper I've seen used in machines for shimming. Uh, most of the machines nowadays have automated shimming or adjustable shimming uh, for the machine so that crowning is no longer really as big an issue as it used to be. But that's what crowning is, is just the lack of the bend in the center of the part. The different types of tooling that you're going to see used, uh, the most common is going to be the knife, knife punch. Um, basically it's for making sharp tight bends. The only issue with it is, is it's limited reach um, because of the parts bending around back towards the machine. So you have a higher collision rate, so you don't get quite the reach with the, the tool as you can some of the others. So that's the only real drawback to that. They're rather small and easy to store. Next, we've got the gooseneck. Um, this is probably the most common tool used. It's kind of rough to store because of its odd shape, and they are somewhat weaker and a little bit bulkier because of the design of them. But you can see um, at the top there, that's where the part typically bends back into and collides with the knife die or the knife punch, which is why the gooseneck is used more often. Good tool, and they last quite a while, but uh, they are a little bit tougher to deal with to, because of the off-centered style balance of the tool, so they're a little rougher to store. Um, next is what I call the lollipop punch. Um, these are performing, used for performing large bends or for bump bending uh, or doing heavier materials. If you're bending half inch, you're not going to be using a, a knife die to do that most of the time. Um, so these are a little bit more rare, but they're out there. You use a fair amount of them, but they are expensive and they are real storage problems because they're, they're large, they're bulky, 
but they're rather fragile as well because you have that whole radius there that if anything happens to it, you've got to have something done with the tool or you're going to have an issue. Um, in the bottom left, we've got offset tooling. This you could see in the video that we showed earlier that has the double contact points. Those, not hard to store, but extremely limited usage because they're only good for the one style of bending. Extensions, extensions can be added to either a knife or a goose or any of the other tools really, but what they're limited by is the amount of stroke height of the machine. How high can it move up so that you can actually reach down into the part? Um, most machines only have an 8 to a 14 inch reach, so extensions aren't always the best option to go for. That's why the gooseneck is still by far more popular. And then last, the flattening die in the bottom right hand corner here, which is used for exactly what it says, flattening materials. Um, and as you would imagine, they are extremely limited use and they are a real storage problem and they are extremely fragile because they're made for precision flattening. So if anything at all happens to them, you have to have the whole surface reground normally. Some of the mathematics in bending that we're going to discuss today. Um, the first one and probably the most key is going to be the K factor. Um, there's a technical description up top of what the K factor is, but basically what the K factor is, is in a, when a, a piece of material is bent, there's an expansion as at the lower part of the material and a compression point at the top of the material. So at the bottom it's expanded where it's stretched around the die. At the top it's compressed where the punch is actually pushing through it. So there is a point in the center that is roughly left undisturbed. That's known as the neutral line or the K factor. By finding this you can then predict how much material you're going to need to perform the bend, how far it's going to stretch out, how much material you're going to lose if it's an over 90 bend, things like that. You can start to predict the results. Here's the formula that you would use to do that as well as the, the visual map for the formula. Next would be bend allowance. Bend allowance, the calculation there is to find the length that it's actually going to, to measure for the arc around the bend so you know how much material to add. Um, the next one would be the bend deduction. This is going to be for like most of your over 90 bends where you're going to actually end up losing material overall so you have to know how much to account for. Uh, standard rule of thumb here, it's a K factor chart that I added to the, to the session here. Basically you've got your lighter materials on the left hand side, your harder materials on the left hand side are going to be your softer materials. The harder materials are going to be on the right hand side and you can see as the as the material gets harder, the K factor starts going up higher and higher. That position where the material is left undisturbed keeps going deeper into the material. So if you can see here for like a half inch mild steel, a point four five K factor is probably fine. If I was bending something a little higher carbon content, like maybe an AR400, I would probably go with like a point four six five or something like that so that you're going to get a little bit more tensile strength out of it. That is a pretty good baseline most of the time and this chart has never really led me wrong so I figured I would include this. Next topic we're going to discuss is going to be precision flat patterns and their importance. Uh, having a perfect flat pattern is paramount with bending any product. If you lose a thousandth of a material it could cost an hour or two at the machine with them having to go in and adjust angles and strengths and stroke distances and things like that. So having a, a, a flat pattern that you can actually count on at the machine is going to be extremely important. It's going to be key to getting the product out the door and getting it right, being able to hold your tolerances, things of that nature. You know, hours and hours can be lost messing with a single part. You'd rather spend that time making money bending parts. The importance of uh, the setup speed of a material and getting the machines ready to go and everything. I've got some numbers here, just a little bit of numbers just so you can look and see how much money you can actually spend. If you're running one press break over three shifts with a burden rate of 40 hours with a setup time of 15 minutes, performing eight setups a day, that's over 12 hours, that's 12 hours lost per day at $40 per hour, $240 a day, $1,200 a week, and then $62,400 a year that's lost, completely wasted, you can't get that back. 
if you can cut down your setup times in half, that puts $31,200 back in your pocket. And that's why you're in business in the first place. Uh, just a little bit about bending software. Here at Sigma Tech, we offer a program called Sigma Bend. What Sigma Bend is is a simulation software used to program and press break offline. It uses full collision detection to detect all surfaces of the machine, the part, and even the shop floor if necessary. It uses your tool library. It's completely uh, customizable to automatically or manually bend your parts. It's going to support bump bending for large bending radiuses and it even supports offset bending. And as far as I know, we're the only people that are taking that on right now. Um, some of the reasons why to use it full offline, uh, it's gonna reduce your need for setup parts. You're gonna get results that are predictable. You have more reliable quoting. You can know you can do the job before it hits the machine. It uses real world information and produce pr you know, results that you can depend on. It's gonna increase your floor efficiency. You're gonna get quicker setup times. You're going to be able to produce precision flat patterns, the fully customizable tool library, and the same easy left to right workflow that you're used to. This is just a picture of some of the machines that are supported. Uh, AccuPress being one of those, Cincinnati. Uh, over on the right hand side there's the Dellum controllers. They're kind of a retrofit controller and they also make controllers for multiple machines. So we do support the DA66T and the DA69T. It does require two extra modules to be able to run the software on the machine itself, but we do have the ability to run those, and that covers several different machine types. The next webinar that we're going to be hosting is going to be the three key factors for quicker setup times. Uh, it's just going to go over some tools organization stuff, kind of optimizing the work area, and just kind of how to set up your brakes and so that everything flows through the area fine with as little bottleneck as possible. And then at the bottom there, I've got my email address. If anybody has any questions or would like a demo of the Sigma Bin software, please feel free to contact me and I'll get back in touch with you as soon as possible.